Yes. This conference will now be recorded. Awesome, great. So that starts off our meeting. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us on this wonderful Monday um, afternoon for the RTD Accountability Committee Governance Subcommittee. So um, kicking it off, uh, we do have the January 21st meeting summary in your packet. So feel free to review those. Um, notes and if there are any questions or concerns, please um, let Doug know um, and we could make any changes to that as needed. All right, so the first thing on our agenda is the summary of um, the second roundtable discussion with our technical staff. Who's taking this one first, Doug? That would be me. Um, right. Melinda, can I share my screen? Yep, let me just give you privileges. Privileges, Ooh. right? <laughs> okay, can you guys see that introductory slide, RTD Accountability Committee? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All righty, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and a Appreciate the opportunity to do this today. I, let me say, that, like this is the second round table we've had now. I've really, really enjoyed those conversations. Um, one, it's a chance to see a bunch of faces I haven't seen in quite some time. Uh, but also I think we've gotten some very, very good feedback. Um, and, you know, I, and it, it amazes me, you know, because these people haven't all been intricately involved in this, um, but, um, you know, very thoughtful questions and and and, and comments um, as we went forth with the first round table and certainly in the second. So what I did, I oh, excuse me, let me see if I can advance the slide. So so what I did, I I I just ran through um, you know the proposed kind of components of a possible service council recommendation with the group and then basically got a reaction to them on various aspects of that and i'll share just kind of a summary of those comments towards the end but i but i thought it'd be uh, useful to for this subcommittee to actually you know for me to run down through the components of the of the of an upcoming recommendation associated with this so for your edification and ultimately um you know you know for, for your action if that happens next month uh madam chair you know or next meeting even you know, we can have that conversation because I know we want to move on to, to other topics. So what I did, so basically I talked about each of these elements that are on the screen, um, the identified issues, the purpose and role of the service councils, um, what the membership might look like, some boundary options that we've uh, at least internally explored, and um, uh, some just a little bit of information on the local service resource allocation. So I'll, I'll just step through those real quick here. Uh, first of all, again, I just a uh, little bit of background on what the, the purpose and role of this RTD Accountability Committee is and its three subcommittees um, to review the structure of the RTD governance and the executive leadership and uh, what problems is the uh, uh, um, RTD um, Accountability Governance Subcommittee trying to solve. And it was the three that you guys have seen many, multiple times, but it's a you know, there's of course interest in local communities and residents having an elevated voice in transit service planning, that two-way collaboration with, with RTD. Um, equity considerations, whether that be both social and geographic considerations in the process, and to build back confidence and trust. And as I always say, it's not necessarily just with RTD, but in government in general. So the purpose, the proposed purpose of the, these uh, sub-regional service councils, um, one and foremost is to improve the collaboration uh, between RTD and the, and the, uh, and the communities. Um, I think you know, this is probably the, the one aspect that we've probably had the most conversations about as a governance subcommittee, the necessity and need to have that. It's, it's almost one of those situations is, I think the local governments are saying, help me help you, right? How, how can local governments help RTD in one, messaging service changes, but also help in finding maybe some innovative solutions, some additional funding, some other ways to mitigate uh, possible service cuts or whatever the issue might be of the day. Um, 
you know, we've also talked about the the uh, these sub regional service councils could be a, a very good forum for um, for uh, for the public to come and provide comment. They're locally accessible. You wouldn't have to go downtown to make give your comments at at RTD. Um, and you know what we do know is that you know you're more likely to receive greater local input and conversation at a more local level because they feel it's a more comfortable space and environment for people. So it's a, it's a very useful tool. And I think the LA Metro, um, those their service councils out there have had tremendous success um, with uh, with this aspect, if nothing else, whether that be just general comment, hearings, and all that kind of good stuff. And last but not least, and the, the, this last bullet is more of just an example of the type of work that sub-regional uh, service councils might be able to do. Um, we had the uh, you know presentation and conversation about um, the development of community-based transit plans to identify gaps in the system. And uh, I you know I think uh, this would be of interest to RTD board members to be able to utilize the service councils in a manner in which um, you know they would find um, just straight up uh, value in doing very specific decentralized work, right? Um, and quite frankly, I mean, it's it's about you know putting those service councils to work on behalf of the RTD board and and their policy initiatives. Okay, the next next section we went into is membership, and I think the overlying theme. Um, that we want in a recommendation is that the representatives of this service council are, are representative of the community at large. So local government representatives, of course, will be there. Elected officials, I would I would suggest and assume. Um, and then obviously transit users. Those two don't need necessarily be mutually exclusive. I'm sure there are elected officials that that use public transportation all the time too, which is great. Um, but transit users either work, live, play. Go to school in the district would be eligible. Um, individuals, uh, you know, at, with disabilities using that you use fixed routes. Um, we kind of made the diff we differentiated between those that use fixed routes and accessoride. Um, but you kind of get the idea. We want a broad spectrum of interest and geography throughout the district um, to participate on this board. So we have multiple uh, yeah, viewpoints um, of the of the community represented on, on the councils. The next area component that we had a conversation about is uh, related to the districts. Now, what the heck should the districts look like, right? So, um, you know, how should we form those districts? What, what, would, what uh, data would be used to determine what the districts look like and how many districts should there be? So we, we presented to the round table um, a couple different options. And of course, this is all based on primarily based on the LA Metro's version. And within their service area, you know, they have five service council districts. Um, now their geography is a little smaller as far as the total service boundary. Um, it's about 1,500 miles square miles. Ours is about 2,400 square miles. But we have a lot of, um, you know, parkland and and uh, rural uh, space within within our district. So it's not all too different. Um, of course, now the density within the LA metro area is significantly greater than than um, than what ours is. So we looked at there was two two options that we provided to them for conversation. So there was um, dividing up this, the the uh, the district um, for the service councils by county boundaries and by travel shed. So the first we looked at was was county boundaries, and these are kind of the pros and cons according to Doug Rex. Nobody else about. Um, you know what uh you know what the pros and cons are to county boundaries um first of all the pros to county boundaries is it's a recognized geopolitical boundary right so it's not going to change very often people know who, what, what it is it's consistent with a with a form concept that is already in existence that being the dr cog sub regional forms that we use for our transportation improvement programs as well as other other policy initiatives and there's community familiarity right i mean um, I'm looking at the, our, our chair, Julie Mullica, today in North Glen. She's, you know, very familiar with other communities within Adams County, and they have a rapport and the ability to, you know, kind of, you know, that camaraderie and friendship really helps in, in uh, you know, 
getting issues out on the table and trying to find those solutions. Um, as far as the cons might go, might be uh, seven counts, there's seven uh, counties within the RTD service, er service area. Is that too many? Is it too many uh, districts for, um, for service councils? And we had that conversation, you know, there is some concern um, and I think we have to respect the uh, RTD, the re staff resources that may be needed to, to staff, adequately staff all, all seven districts. Um, and I know Bill Van Meter has been on um, in an earlier conversation when we had about this and, you know, staff is intrigued by this concept, but they do have some concerns about their ability to adequately staff. So I think that is something we certainly have to keep in mind. Um, uh, communities, communities cross county boundaries. Oh yeah. So, so there are communities within our region, of course, that, that bridge more than one county, right? Like Aurora, for example, they're actually in three um, Westminster's into Arvada's into, you know, there's, there's plenty that, that kind of bridge that and how would, you know, is that just adding a degree of complexity that's not needed, but we've handled that through the Dr. Cogstop Regional Forum too. So it's, it's just something we had to keep in the back of our mind as we're doing this. Um, and the other, the, the other so-called con is that the you know, majority of the bus routes, um, you know, Jesse Carter came and gave a presentation on their operations, but the majority of the bus routes within our, our the RTD service area are serve multiple counties. I think it's right around 60% or so of all bus routes that they have are multi-county. So how do you handle that conversation if indeed the service councils are going to have a hand in um, uh, developing and or recommending um, service changes? So this is just a little map just to give you some context about, um, you know, what the travel patterns are within a county. So what you see here, these percentages that you see here by county represent internal trips. So they're internal to internal trips. So these are the, the total trips. Now, these are person trips, total person trips, regardless of mode that um, that begin in a county and end in the same county. So, for example, up here in the top left-hand corner, um, Boulder County. 88% of person trips in Boulder County um, stay within Boulder County. Now, I think Boulder's a little more, you know, more unique maybe than, than the other counties within our region. Well, you can see that they are. Um, and, uh, but we I think should we're also- We think we're unique too. I was gonna say, oh, you got me, Elise. I was gonna say for a whole host of reasons. <laughs> I think the word is special like in so many ways. <laughs> right. Now, I, 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 I should also preface my comments by saying, uh, just letting you guys know where this data came from. This is Dr. Cox. This is model data. So this came up out of our travel demand forecasting model, and they represent 2020, our 2020 run. So it's actually, it's pre-COVID. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that. So, um, yeah, so well, you'll see. Also about that too, Doug, is it's also automobile trips. It's yeah, not it's all it's all it, yeah it's person trips uh, uh, right. right so it's 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 automobile transit bicycle pedestrian trips all the above yep. yep and um so and the reason we did it that way one you know it's all about future growth and ridership too so this is basically your entire market right that that is available to to transit yeah. to to convert to transit let's say right um, but you'll see for the most part, and Broomfield's a little different, of course, uh, you know, they're only at 43%, um, and they do have quite a bit of, of uh, trips traverse either to Boulder County or, or into Denver. But you'll see most of them, you know, kind of in around 70% of the trips um, stay internal to do the county. On the, uh, so the other option that we presented to the round table was based on travel shed, and we've had a couple conversations about this. Um, as far as the so-called pros, according to Doug Rex, is uh, you know they're based on known travel patterns. I mean, I think anecdotally, we you know we we know that our system is is pretty radial in nature, kind of pulsing, you know, kind of downtown and then out, right, for the most part. Now, I will say, as we continue to grow as a region, um, and um, and our development patterns become more mature, we are seeing a lot more. Um, you know, cross-directional travel uh, more and more through the years that um, wasn't necessarily the case, let's say, 20 years ago. Um, 
and the other pro, of course, is that you know there's potential for fewer districts, right? I mean, you can really design those districts based however you want to design those. So the example that I'm going to show you, we kind of design them around major facilities within within the region, um, and you won't be surprised when you see it. But it's just it's a, it's 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 just it's just a representative um, uh, sample of what you couldn't what you can do. Um, some of the cons, and I'm not sure these are actually really cons, but um, you know, one because the I mean, this is a pro and a con, I guess, is that because the boundary is not predefined what that district is, um, you know, um, you know, it can be it can be, I guess, gerrymandered to a degree. I, I but it but it, it, it's flexible enough that you can make it look like what you want it to make it look like. So maybe that's a pro more than a con. Um, but I think we. You know, we want to be very careful if we if this is a direction that ultimately the the powers to be want to, want to explore, then make sure that there's you know consideration given to equal population within those districts. Um, community boundaries need to be considered. Try to get as um, you know the entire community um, in a district as possible. I'll tell you the one that we're having the most problems with is like Centennial. Centennial is really hard because it's just it's so linear, it's so it's elongated, you know, and um, and it's just big. <laughs> so uh, um, and also keep in consideration the RTD districts, right? I mean, there could be a situation in which of the 15 districts, you might be able to pop three of these RTD districts within one of these service councils, which I think would be very efficient for um, for the board directors for sure. Um, to be able to participate, though they won't have to participate. So Troy won't have to participate in like you know three different service councils or whatever. Because I, I'm not that he. I mean, I know he's got nothing to do right now and he's looking for for new stuff all the time. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at the travel shed. So here's the travel shed that analysis. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's the analysis we did. Um, so the boundaries that we use is this kind of fuchsia line. So we divided the region up into four. Um, we just wanted to have a look to see if it was possible and what it would look like. And um, so if you can see these fuchsia lines, uh, you can see how we developed it. So we have a north section, which is uh, most of, uh, so it's Boulder, Broomfield, um, about half of Adams County or the more densely populated portions of Adams County. Um, then we have the east section, which is the rest of Adams and the majority of, um, of Arapahoe. And then the south, which includes um, all of Douglas or the majority of Douglas, um, bits and pieces of, of Arapahoe. And um, then out west, got Jefferson, a little bit of, a little bit of Douglas out there too. So it's, um, but I think, you know, you, you would agree that you know most of the actual travel patterns would occur within within those boundaries, and I know they're pretty big, but you'll see that um, oh shoot, sorry, sensitive mouse, that um, you know the percents of internal trips, so trips that that start and end within each district is a little bit higher than at the county level, right? So we're looking at you know kind of mid 70s versus you know upper 60s, around 70 percent by counties. Um, so it was pretty intriguing, and and you'll see we kind of just basically, you know, we crisscrossed. Um, uh, I think it was like a Colfax and Broadway is where these all terminate. Um, so that's basically, you know, kind of the the center of this 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 whole thing. So Doug, uh, Denver County would be included, of course, in all of these service districts because obviously they, they. It's just a, it's a it's a different way of looking at this relationship, right? That if um, you know we want to look at you know share travel patterns and what the service councils um, um, you know what their role potentially could be in, in talking about uh, service planning and the like, that it just makes sense that a consideration should be related to the existing patterns that exist. Mm -hmm. So Doug, I, I like this idea um, of of kind of how they all come together there. Um, because it, one of the things that we were concerned about in this discussion was, you know, is regionalism going to just kind of get lost <laughs> right. in this kind of service council idea? And, um, you know, seeing how they all 
essentially like terminate towards the end, you know, we all have, um, you know, a, an effort to, to keep that those regional projects alive as well. Um, I am just going to go real quick to the chat. It looks like Deborah said um, she suggests using terminology other than districts for the new for any new community entity to avoid confusing with RTD districts. So I think that's wow. helpful. Um, I like that you call these sectors. That's kind of a, a yeah. different terminology. We don't have anywhere else. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that, that's good comments. It's important. Uh, yeah, because yeah, you're right. I mean, I think we talk about districts so liberally anymore. It's hard to keep track of which ones we're talking about, right? There's all kinds of districts everywhere. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so the last conversation that I wanted to share with the group, uh, with the roundtable, and want to share with you all is this idea of resource allocation. You know, so we we've had had some conversations about you know some equitable distribution, and at the first roundtable, um, the those in attendance kind of shared you know what that equitable distribution should look like for local local service planning, um, uh, local local service planning analysis um, that, you know, vulnerable populations should be an important concern in, in what that um, what that distribution looked like. Population employment, of course, should be in there. But ultimately, it should be a very transparent process and and how that how that uh, or how and what that should look like. Um, I will tell you this because I'm not sure I shared with this with you at the last meeting um, that you know, as part of the recommendation, if this is an area that we wanted to, you know, kind of uh, have more conversation about um, with regards to, you know, this this equitable distribution of of uh, funding throughout the area for service planning work, that uh, RTD, um, they're scheduled to do a kind of to study the supply and demand side of service delivery. Um, actually, Dr. Oh, uh, here we go. There's the dogs. Um, that our um, that Dr. Cog is actually providing some funding for part of that this analysis. So, you know, knowing where the, the tax revenue comes from is kind of the, that's the easiest part of this equation, right? It's actually determining what the value of the service that our residents are getting provided as for, for, for that funding is the most difficult thing to do. And it's very difficult to tell that story. So part of this, so part of this um, study will kind of, um, We'll kind of vet that out, right, and kind of come up with, um, you know, some way to be able to characterize the value of the service that communities are getting. Um, so we, it's, um, I believe, it's intended to be done over the next year. Uh, I don't know when it's beginning. Um, I don't know if Bill Soroy or Brian Welsh or someone is on uh, here on here on the call that could provide some additional detail. But um, yeah, so so that's that's planned, and I think that's going to be a very useful tool to, um, uh, well, this committee, I'm sure will be finished by then, but for the next the next iteration of these conversations, wherever they may occur. And la that's it. So that's what I shared with, um, with the group. I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen here. Um, and uh, so I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I thought the conversation that resulted you know, after I gave that presentation, I thought it was really good. I, um, I think, if nothing else, there was a very strong appreciation for what problems are we trying to solve. So, what is what problems is this is the RTD accountability trying to solve? And that was my what second second slide that I showed you guys. Um, you know, I think they all felt the need to increase the two way collaboration. They felt that was paramount. That 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 um, that that level of communication uh, continue to increase. Um, and while most believe that this service council would have would have the ability um, to enhance that collaboration, some were hesitant about the role service councils should play in service planning, um, since they believe that process should be, should be data driven. Um, they, I think there was maybe some concern by some that, you know, about politicizing, you know, that service delivery. And, um, you know, I, I think that's, it, it's, it was an interesting co comment and there was some conversation that resulted um, from, from that conversation. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, there were, there were, there were, there were others that uh, obviously saw the value of service councils as, you know, as an important tool to increasing that local input, input and deciding 
what local transit should look like um, because it brings local decision making closer to home. Um, there's opportunities to raise more revenue, um, more accountability at the local level, then provides and then builds more confidence in in the electorate for for future ballot initiatives, maybe even at the local level to support public transportation. Um, what else? Um, I, they also thought that uh, you know the local service councils could help in providing some innovation in service delivery. Um, let me see. I know that there were others on the call that um, uh, that might have other thoughts on on what was said. And I I did. I, I and I will provide you guys for the at the next meeting. We'll include in your packet kind of a video to that roundtable, and I can provide you know kind of quick summary of everybody's comments as well if that helps but that was for the most part I think that was the conversation I think everybody felt there was you know a role for the service councils but some were a little hesitant whether that is uh, should be related to service planning it provides it is a good place to to for public comment and debate but um, um, but not everybody felt strongly that you know, service planning was one of those issues. That's it, Madam Chair. I'd be happy to to take any questions. Yeah, any questions from this group? Go ahead, Brett. I, I did want to make the uh, emphasize a point that there were people that were concerned that it would increase the uh, complexity of the process for RTD. And, and as you said earlier, the amount of uh, overhead there might be of people that have to be assigned to interface with the service councils. Um, I think one of the issues that's always been a, a big concern is that a lot of people in the in the district in these areas of whatever we're going to call are are uh, are surprised by some of the changes that happen in terms of routes and things like that and and feel separated from that whole process and i think that the big benefit that everybody saw potentially here was a better way to communicate and understand where those changes are coming from it's a real point of sensitivity that i that i i thought came out in those discussions did you see that too doug I did, yeah. Okay, um, I saw Dana's hand and then we'll go to Elise and then Jackie. Uh, yeah, thank you, Julie. Um, Doug, I just had a clarifying question on the travel shed map. I'm assuming that the percentages in each of these sectors is based on future growth in the region. Is that correct? No, it's based on a 2020 run that we did. Uh, so it's pre-COVID. So it's based on observed data that we we model and calibrate too. So it's uh, it's based on today's travel patterns while pre-COVID. No. <laughs> All right, Elise. Opportunity map. It's an opportunity map. Well, <laughs> after, I was just curious, and I'm sorry I couldn't participate in in the conversation, but um, whether or not the there were folks there that had had experience with the Dr. Cog, and Dr. Cog sub-regional forums, because some of the comments about, um, you know, needing to build local trust, because if, for example, you were gonna leverage local dollars, those dollars are probably gonna be raised at the local level um, of, say, county. And whereas some abstract, I, there's pros and cons, but an abstract sort of does, divvying up a line and setting a quarter of the district aside, there's no way that entity will be able to raise funds. So I, I think it is important to think about as we try to build trust, what level do, does that trust need to be built on? And also the, the comment about politicizing, like I, I don't want to politicize um, decision-making around service delivery. On the other hand, let's face it, democracy is important and we need to hear directly from some users. But I thought the the, the sub-regional forums that we use for the TIP were pretty good because you had a local elected official from each jurisdiction and you had a staff person who actually was the subject matter expert that was bringing data 
So it wasn't, it, it was more balanced. I, I think you would need to add to that other voices to make sure that um, the user community was represented better, that there was equity considerations that were represented. But, but I think that model is, is one that, that worked quite well in balancing out being data driven with hearing from the local community that's being served. And I think that's how we're gonna have to, to rebuild trust and leverage funds. So yeah, I agree, more an observation than a question, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Lise. I, I, um, I do too. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think the point was that, you know, when it comes to service del delivery and the importance of that, that it has to be a data driven process um, and that, see, I, I see the, the role of elected officials and others is helping to find solutions to possible service cuts and through whether that be, you know, the possibility of additional funding or innovative solutions, those types of things, right? Um, but and, but to, to your question, or yes, to your question about the Dr. Cox subregion models, if that was, that was talked about, of course, yes, and it was glowing. I do, I'm saying that for you, Elise, because because I know not everybody in Boulder County was in love with it when it first came out. But, but I think I think um, I we've think we've come seen over. Something. We've come over to right? the dark side. We love the subregional forums now. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, you're saying that now. You're out of office. Uh, I say a lot of things now that I'm out of office. <laughs> Lucky you. Uh, All sure. right. Yeah, no, yeah, so the difference is for me is I'll say I'm whether I'm in office or not. So um, so <laughs> the beauty of me, uh, I uh, the more I hear about this, the more excited I am about the opportunity for the sub-regional uh, or the, I'm not, you know, the local service area uh, input. I actually, what I struggle with is the data used to drive this is declining. The, the past service modifications has been declining ridership. I would much rather have an opportunity-based conversation about how you can drive ridership. And I don't think you're going to be able to have that conversation unless you start having these local area service councils. I think Boulder is the poster child for doing it right in growing the ridership and then turning it over and identifying where there are gaps in service. And um, I think we will continue to see declining ridership and we'll continue to just see cuts unless we look at a different model and a more bottom up approach to service design. And I would call that data driven, data positive data driven decision making versus negative. We're reinforcing the negative and it's the chicken and the egg and we're spiraling down ridership. So. Um, I, I, I guess I disagree with the premise that, that it wouldn't be data driven. And I think uh, the, and, and Doug, I, I really would appreciate honest feedback. I think the benefits from Dr. Cog staffing those sub-regional councils far outweighed any additional cost and uh, to, to the organization or um, even, um, uh, bandwidth of, of your staff because of the benefits derived from the contact with the local jurisdictions and the engagement with the local jurisdictions. And I would suggest that the local jurisdictions also benefited extremely from those relationships and seeing their uh, public works peers or their local elected peers and really talking about uh, regional solutions and understanding regional issues, at least at the county level. And when you look at the, I'm looking, I've got your charts on my other thing, so excuse me, but when you look at the travel shed data and how many intra-county, the percentage of intra-county trips, that dialogue is extremely important for the local electeds and the public works professionals in those counties to be having with each other to understand how people are moving in their communities and what opportunities exist to get people out of single occupancy vehicle cars into, uh, into whether it's the RTD service or some intra-county service or intra-city service. And those discussions cannot happen unless there are forums dedicated to having them happen, right? So I really think the local service area councils are extremely important. I'm becoming more and more of an advocate for it. The other thing I like about the pinwheel, I call it the pinwheel, where you've got the four sectors, is that the, that, that the representation, 
I think it's important for, as the, as the mayor of the city of Lone Tree to represent the entire city of Lone Tree and not a district. When I was a, when I was a council member and representing district one, I really still didn't see myself as only representing district one. If district one was successful and, and district two wasn't successful, really was Lone Tree successful? I, I think there's skin in the game to have board members, our elected officials having conversations about what are the needs in Denver at Colfax and Broadway and how do we balance those needs with the needs in in the town of Park or, or the town of, or the city of Lone Tree. And I think those elected officials conversations and those staff conversations are so valuable. So anyway, there's my two. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, and I actually agree with a lot of Jackie's comments. Um, I think that, you know, those conversations are really important and, and to push um, people to be thinking about how do I move from North Thornton to the heart of Denver, you know, because there's people who do that commute every single day. Um, and so really kind of still driving that regionalism. Now, one of the questions, I'm just kind of looking at the map here, guys. So we love the tip form, right, process. That was a county process. These sectors are a lot bigger than our local counties. Do we feel like the same success could happen um, with these bigger sectors. Now, of course, a lot of it has to do with staffing and, you know, um, you know, the way that travel works and things like that. I'm just kind of, I, I, I think we can make it work, but I just noticed there's a huge difference from, you know, our tip days. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. Julie, if, if I can just respond really briefly, I mean, as I'm looking at I'm going to call it the pinwheel because I really like that, Jackie, the, the sectors. Um, you know, I, I feel like that could be, the, the success of the tip could be replicated in a very different way. As I'm looking at it, and this is very much just a gut reaction, and Lynn and Troy probably know much better than I do, but some of these sectors look as though they connect or they intersect, I should say, with multiple RTD districts, at least two RTD board districts. Um, from what I can tell in at least a couple of these sectors. So I think it could be positive even at the board level as they think about not just thinking in how do I how do I get adequate service into my district, but really I also need to consider this other neighboring district, which is also within my sector. So it kind of elevates the conversation um, and hopefully pushes a, a little bit broader partnerships. Great. Go ahead, Elise. Well, I just wondered, I guess I'm a little bit confused because I was thinking that the local service councils were largely looking more locally and that RTD would stay sort of in charge of the regional routes. Um, if the local service councils are also in charge of regional routes, that might come up with a different configuration. But if RTD is still sort of the, again, using the tip forum, Sub, sub regional forums as a model that you know the Dr. Cog board oversaw the regional projects and the sub regions focused on you know inside the county um, so I guess I, I keep coming back to the county level being the manageable level and that yes we need to talk about uh, talk across county lines and we did in the sub regional forums but RTD would still be sort of the the uh, the RTD board would be looking at the regional lines. So anyway, I don't know if, Doug, there was discussions about uh, the, the division of labor between local and regional in the conversations. Yeah, there was, Elise. Um, yeah, and I, I think the point was was made that you just made, quite frankly, was, was that, you know, it's, uh, you know, if the conversation is about you know local service right versus the regional service you know the core regional service then you know the count that that county district concept you know makes some sense but i think you know where where um um you know the argument kind of falters a little bit is that you know there's just so many routes existing rtd bus routes that are multi-county 60 plus percent that you know there was there was at least some concern about that and how does it play out so then that was why we began then to look at travel patterns to see if we could you know basically uh, accommodate 
you know, within a district, those travel patterns and as a result, those multi-county routes. You know, it's, it's listen, there's, there's no perfect district as we all know. Um, and, you know, at, at least I, I think, you know, the, the subcommittee should consider that just, you know, that um, the next iteration of this, you know, if this is a recommendation that the, that the partners want to evaluate and move forward with, that we provide them with a couple of examples of, of ways they could do this, whether this be through the county forums or through, through travel sheds and give them some pros and cons to work with. There's, you know, there's so much work and the complexity of the issues, I think, you know, we obviously don't have time to do that. We need to wrap this up in the next meeting or so. And, but, but yeah, you, but, um, but that point was made at least, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense for sure. All right, go ahead, Rep. So Madam Chair, one, one, one chair to another. <laughs> the, one of the things I think that's a challenge here is for the sub-regional districts to be able to get all the data they need to really understand for example, the economics of the things that they may want to do. And it could really put a big burden on RTD to constantly be responding to all of these different requests for different, as, as I know, because I've been doing a lot of those requests. But having a central place, and that's one of the things that I hope our, this dashboard that uh, finances committee is working on could, could provide financial and operational and and the economic, you know, the the um, planning data that's all going on there, and give a window into all of that without having to hit RTD every time you you need one other piece of information. And so we'd love to work with you guys on uh, on figuring out what needs to go into that. But Rebecca White's leading that one, so uh, I'm confident that it will turn out well. But it, it can be a a window into that for all of the regional councils. Yeah, agree. No, that that sharing of information we'll have to figure out how that works out. So um go ahead, Ron. Sorry to chime in, but it, it seems to me like one of the fundamental questions that the group needs to sort of wrestle through before taking too many more steps towards sort of the size of the configurations of the sectors is what specific functions do you want sort of those planning councils to take on those local councils to take on because at one of the spectrum is they are really doing sort of local service planning and 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 system service planning with and on behalf of RTD and making very formal service recommendations to the RTD board with some allotment of resources or or some mechanism versus sort of working in partnership perhaps with RTD staff on sort of responding to and influencing local service planning and then sort of making recommendations to the board and that's an important distinction that might influence how you structure the the geographies of those areas i think that's a really good question ron um and so i think a lot of that um it well the the difference between that isn't going to be based on resources and what what kind of work can be done at kind of like the local service council level. Um, and then, yeah, I, I feel like that's what I would get kind of stuck on. Like, do we have the support to do, um, to really dive in and really focus on those local uh, service changes? Or is it gonna be more of like your second option of trying to influence the process? And what does that look like? Other thoughts on Ron's question and, and the specific role of the service council? Go ahead, Elise. Well, I guess what's not working right now or what hasn't worked historically, pre-Deborah, of course, um, is, uh, is that uh, service delivery decisions are effectively, you know, the cake's mostly baked by RTD. This is how it feels. And then it comes to local communities and we get to react, you know, and there's public hearings. But unless we throw a hizzy fit, it feels like the cake's pretty much baked. And what would be really, I think, more effective and foster better outcomes is if 
the local service councils were in at the ground floor. Here's the amount of resources we have. Here's the here's the data. Um, what you know? What would be the best um, you know uh, delivery options for locally in order to maximize the outcomes we want and have, to be a part of the conversation at that end, the very beginning. Um, so, the, and I and I suppose to Ron's question, that could have lev different levels of of you know, staffing, but I think the timing of the process is what's really essential is to be in at the beginning, the scoping progress process, rather than reacting to something that RTD brings to us. Go ahead, Lynn. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of good conversation here. And um, uh, I agree. I think that the, the two things I've heard the most in the committee is, get get uh these decisions to us before they're made you know bring them so we can we can have feedback and is there a way to create more of a partnership so that maybe local funding can can uh, enhance our transit uh options uh, i see deborah's uh, deborah's there she she knows these much better than i do but i i uh i do think you know that that taking some of these decisions some of these ideas back as as doug was saying and uh getting staff to to sort of say this one makes sense for these reasons and and this one doesn't for these other reasons might be helpful to the committee Go ahead, Dave. yeah i think um i really appreciate the question ron because i i think it's prompted us to think a little bit differently about how we might approach this and um I think it gets back to what is the the problem that we're trying to solve. I I think I am am I will just share where I'm kind of landing and and the idea of the travel shed map seems really appealing to me for a couple of reasons. But I I see it as Jackie referenced an opportunity map, right? So if we look at it from what are future opportunities of even growth within the region, we could slice it a couple of different ways. And I think. It, it may not necessarily be the boundaries themselves right now, but just this kind of concept of like, how do we use this as the opportunity that we want to work towards to solve the issue we're trying to solve, given where we know people move and how people move, um, to really just address the day-to-day -day pain points that people are facing when they experience public transit. Great, thank you, Dea. Um, so, yeah, I agree, Ron. Um, what I, I think that this group, you know, is definitely leaning towards being part of the conversation earlier on, and so um, I think that that would take us to the first option that you were kind of outlining, um, and so I, I feel like that's definitely what we've been hearing a lot more is you know, less reactive, more part of the process. And so um, I hope that helped answer your question. I don't know, does it, or do you have a, a further clarification for this group? No, it's, I, I mean, I, I think that's that's very helpful, hopefully for all of you. And it, it's not particularly helpful for, I mean, whether it's helpful for me isn't the question. I, I just wanted to prompt the conversation for you mm -hmm. all. Because okay. there, and and I agree, early on involvement. I, that's what I hear consistently from all of you saying. Mm -hmm. That slightly different, maybe, and maybe it's more of a clarification for Elise. Is that slightly different than sort of specific resources, sort of allocated to a geographic area, and that geographic area doing very specific service planning, sort of on its own, obviously with interaction with other geographies. Which I agree with her. Probably would lead to smaller geographies, maybe at the county level. Um, whereas sort of that early engagement and working more in sort of partnership with RTD in that kind of service planning, but not exactly housing the service planning in the geographies might give you the flexibility to have larger geographies. At least that's the way I was thinking about it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, so I see that we only have nine minutes left. We do have another agenda item, but Doug, I think it's fine if we push that um, to our next meeting. And I, one question, and I just wanted to circle back with this subcommittee 
is um, the rest of Doug's uh, presentation when it came to, um, he does have, you know, the county boundaries versus the travel shed, but also is there anything else that we're missing as we're trying to wrap up this conversation around service councils? Um, we did have a, a slide on membership. Um, is there anything specific that we wanted to change there or um, anything to change it like on the purpose or, or identified issues um, section? Because what I would like to see is that, you know, we continue to like, try and <laughs> wrap around trying to finalize um, what our recommendation could look like um, for this particular topic before, you know, we'd be, we want to move on to the discussion with partnership. So um, any feedback that this group has for, for anything else for Doug um, and, and what this recommendation would look like would be appreciated. Well, at least. Well, I think we should think a, a little bit too about um, what's a manageable size and what are the essential sort of members that, that are needed. If you want to make it data driven, that means, I think, it implies that somebody's going to have to spend some time doing some homework and investing some time in understanding the data and maybe liaison, liaisoning back with the community, perhaps that they represent. So um, I, I, we just might have more input on that. So it's, I think it's a little bit less, you know, we get 20 citizens together, like they're going to be people that are going to, um, we want to intentionally make sure that um, swaths of the community are represented in the comments that they can make, or that they do make rather, and um, and that they have the time to invest in order for it to be really as data-driven as it sounds like folks believe it needs to be. So I don't know if we have any more comments on that, um, whether or not they should represent constituencies and that there should be certain sort of, you know, maybe there's some general citizen slots um, but I would think that there would be um, communities of interest in particular that we would want to see on these councils. Right. Unmuting myself. One thought, one thought on that was it would, I think it would be beneficial if there were a, were a way to have a place where they met that was at the junction of transit and that all of those people were, were given transit passes as part of their participation and their service to that district. And they actually used that in order to get to the meetings. So they, they have some real life feel for what uh, riding a bus or riding light rail is like. And, um, and it's a part of that process. When they arrive at their, their meetings to talk about transit, they arrive at them by riding on transit. I, I saw this in the discussions in, in LA. It's one of the things that they're doing, they push out there a lot, is to have real transit riders involved in this. Exactly, that yeah. goes to what you were talking about, about having not just the electeds or just, just the, you know, the grass tops people, but having actual people that are that are really living with it every day. Exactly. Yeah. And I, and I think that would be the focus is of having actual transit users um, have a large role to play in this. Um, Jackie, did I see your hand up? I don't know if you said me or Dea. Dea, oh, you Jackie, go. go ahead. Oh, no, Jackie, or you go, go first. Oh. I'll go after. Okay. okay. <laughs> the only thing I was going to suggest is I think one of the reasons one of the many reasons that Dr. Cog's sub-regional councils worked was the were the tax associated with them, the technical advisory committees. And I do think, to Elise's point about it being a data-driven process, I think we need to have folks sitting on the uh, council, as Rut said, that are transit riders that represent diversity in our communities and and really um, the broad swath of who RTD serves. But I also think we need the data crunching folks on the technical side who are going to be providing input in presentations. And that's what certainly led the process for the, for the uh, and that wasn't just, that wasn't just Dr. Cog's staff, that was our local staffs that were involved in doing that. And I think um, to me, that's where you may 
you're not going to see a pushback in Lone Tree for it because we're totally committed, but from maybe some of the other jurisdictions about devoting their staff's time to serving as the advisory committees for the, the councils. So that that's just a, a piece of it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just want to echo at least how I interpreted Rhett's comment in terms of um, if we want communities to be engaged and involved in the process, especially those that are transit writers, um, we do need to provide them some sort of stipend or at least honor area um, in recognition of their service because oftentimes we ask communities to participate at tables and yet we don't necessarily compensate them um, adequately enough for their for their time um, and their efforts, especially if we're talking about um, communities of color who don't necessarily have um, a seat at the table oftentimes. I think the other thing that I just want to lift up is um, in terms of, and I, I think they touched on this, if I remember correctly, in the LA presentation that even in the earliest days, it was still institutional um, representatives, so institutional representatives from nonprofit organizations or um, transit advocacy groups. And I don't think it, it seemed like it wasn't until recently that they were able to get like low income transit riders at these local coordinating councils. I'm just gonna call them that for right now. Um, so I think we just need to acknowledge that it's gonna be a pipeline in order for us to get um, communities of color and other folks at these tables um, and just think about what other creative partnerships might exist. I mean, we don't necessarily have the Citizens Academy anymore, but Denver Streets Partnership has their advocacy group and just how do we start to build leadership um, for folks to have a seat at the table. It would be beneficial, I think, too, if where they met was near a transit junction, because, you know, it doesn't do any good to drop, to, to bring somebody to a mile away from where they're actually going to meet. And, you know, it's a big enough area that surely we can find some place that's, that's a junction of different routes. Yes, agreed. Lots of details to be um, hashed out on those lines. So, you know, I think today's conversation was really helpful as we continue to, to push through and, and define um, a little bit more about what our intentions are behind this recommendation. Um, I mean, the goal of this subcommittee isn't to have all the answers, isn't to, to solve all the world's problems. Um, but, you know, I think that we have a really good idea here that a lot of people are excited about. Um, thank you for uh, reaching out to our, our technical staff um, and for their um, participation in the call because they've really been, um, you know, an important valued resource to this table. So, Doug, um, I don't know, any final last words, next steps for this group? Um, I know that we do want to move on to the conversation of partnerships as we're still trying to, to close out this item. So, um, I don't know, anything else from, from you? Well, not from me. Uh, I, I agree with you. We need to wrap up uh, this part of our uh, task list for sure. Um, I, I mean, if we could kind of settle on some kind of recommendation at the next meeting, I think that would be advisable. Okay, yeah, and I think if you, if, if there's a draft, um, that you could send out to the, the subcommittee um, for us to review. I keep getting bombarded back here. Who are these? Um, and so um, <laughs> that we can um, review and then just kind of see if there's any uh, additional tweaks or gaps or anything that we need to, to address. I think that could be really helpful for us um, just to close this out and then um, anything final that we need to determine for uh, this next group. So. I hit mom in the face. I hit mom in the face. <laughs> Don't worry What's about him. <laughs> okay. So, um, thank you so much, um, everybody, for joining us today and for um, being part of this <laughs> conversation. And welcome to my five year old son. He's awesome. Um, and so, uh, I think. Yeah, moving forward, we are going to be moving forward with partnerships in our next conversations. Um, we we want to to move on to that, and so we'll look for some recommendations, some final draft recommendations to consider, and then we'll keep moving, guys. Thank you so much for all of your hard work and your thoughts and your time. Um, it's very much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks. Good week, everybody. Thank you, everybody. We'll talk to you all soon. Have a good rest of your day. You too.